Thank you, Chris. Um, I could have used a bigger buildup, but that's all right. Uh, just kidding. Yeah, so as Chris mentioned, I've spent um, close to 30 years in spatial computing, metaverse technology. Yes, it's been around that long, in case you're young and didn't realize that. Uh, these technologies, well, if you saw Ari's keynote, you know these technologies have been in development for a long time. And I first worked on VRML, the first 3D standard for the internet back in the 90s. Um, I also worked on a technology called uh, GLTF, which is the ubiquitous file format for 3D models on the internet now. I'll be talking about that uh, for a moment later in this talk. Um, worked at Unity for several years, running VR and AR for them, and then joined Neil Stevenson's blockchain company, Lamina One, a few years ago. If you don't know who Neil Stevenson is, he's the fellow who coined the term metaverse, wrote a novel called Snow Crash, which some of you may have read. Some of you may have read the reworked version of that called Ready Player One by Ernst Klein that came out 20 years after that. Um, so these, these are the books that you know, talk about the metaverse. So I was privileged to work with uh, Neil for about a year and a half when I then decided I really needed to pivot back to what I used to do way back in the day, which is uh, creative music and art, and that's what I'm doing full time now. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that journey because along the way, this is how I discovered and started leaning in to Web3. Uh, so to me, and this is why I joined up with Neil and Lamina One, and I still believe in this with all of my heart and soul, we cannot have an open metaverse without Web3. And when I talk about Web3, I'm gonna unpack it in the very next slide and say what I mean by that. But this is really all about um, removing as many centralized players and gatekeepers as possible from the infrastructure that underlies the metaverse. Because you know we can have open standards, we can have committees, we can have all this stuff without, but without the commercial freedom to do what we need, ultimately this is going to be a metaverse that will be controlled by a very small number of players otherwise. So this is why this is near and dear to my heart. This has been my career mission for so long. It really is a brave new decentralized world and I'm just gonna throw around a few terms because when people hear Web3, they might not know what we're talking about here. Fundamentally, it's about blockchain technology. So global, immutable, transparent ledger that everybody can read, unless of course you want privacy, then you have private blockchains. But the idea is the database is shared by everyone and out of anyone's control. Um, cryptocurrency, we all know a lot about crypto and that's where a lot of, I think, the FUD happens around Web3 in fact. But it's a global system for people to get paid, pay each other, buy digital assets, um, and perform um, decentralized financial transactions as well, not controlled by big banks with no transparency. There's you know, so much to unpack here, but I just wanted to kind of review a few of the terms that are really key in this world. And some of these blockchains, for example, the Ethereum blockchain or Solana, are programmable as well. So you can put code onto the blockchain that will get executed, and that supports you know, this financial uh, transaction system where robots can trade all day long um, and out in the open again. And we've probably all heard about NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Uh, what the name really means though, I mean, technically that's what the term is, but what the name really means is a digital asset format. Uh, I don't mean, you know, media format like 3D or, or JPEG, but, you know, a packaging of the asset so that it can then be uniquely identified on a public blockchain. That's when an NFT is, and I'll be talking about those quite a bit a little later. And decentralized asset storage, so you're not necessarily under one cloud provider and people can participate in an infrastructure more broadly uh, known as DPIN, which I'm gonna get to in a second, which is just decentralize the entire cloud infrastructure. And we're seeing a lot of movement in these areas, as well as open social networks. If you've heard of the Fediverse or some of these other um, terms like social fi, I don't like that one because it's financial in nature and blockchains are a little over financialized in my opinion. Or Web3 social is now a term people are, are throwing around. But the idea is you can make social type of posts that aren't running on a single social network and they're based on open protocols and then people can build different pieces of client software and apps that run on that. So that's really cool. So these are all the technologies we're talking about that underlie Web3 and they're not controlled by anyone. And why that's important is it's really about self-sovereignty, controlling your own destiny, and self-determination. And that's, that's creative freedom, that's cultural freedom. Again, where do you want to distribute? Who do you want to talk to? What audiences and communities do you want to build? And economic, financial, which underpins a lot of this. Because no matter what we're doing, whether we're creatives or technologists, at some point or another, we need to eat. We need to get paid, right? And so this is uh, a place where I think Web3 takes a lot of the flack, but it's actually one of the biggest enabling parts of everything that goes on in the Web3 infrastructure. Yes, I think a lot of it's over-financialized, but essentially, again, if we can line this up so 
people have creative and financial freedom, we win. Now, when you think about NFTs and you think about content in Web3, I'm sure bored apes come to mind. I'm sure when you see this, you don't think, I'm just going to say, you don't think high art. But we're in a judgment-free zone here. Art is in the eye of the beholder. But largely, a, a collection like Bored Apes is a collectible. It's like Pokemon cards. It's a trading card system where people are betting on these things having collectible value. And that has created a lot of the perception around NFTs. But do you know with NFTs, you can also do amazing digital art like this. This is by a woman named Afsane. She is Iranian. She is one of several Iranian women artists who, whose art I've collected. I have gotten to know Afsane over the last couple of years because I love her work so much. And those women over there in Iran right now are in major uproar, if you haven't been paying attention to the news. There's a lot going on there. And this is a global platform for them to share their work and share their voices. And I'm delighted that I could be able to support them. And this is just one example of actual real fine art that happens in Web3. It's just a digital piece of art. I mean, sometimes the artists sell the NFT and they'll send you a canvas if you want. I bought uh, a few where I've gotten the physical canvas after, but it's a piece of digital art. I spent a few hundred dollars US on it and I get to support an artist like this. This is amazing. Now, me, I'm also a lifelong musician. I'm gonna tell you my story in a second. And I started looking at what was going on in music as well, not just visual arts, and started tweeting about music NFTs thinking, you know, one of these days I'm going to get back to my first love music. I was still, you know, working, had a day job. And I'm thinking, how am I going to release my music? I'm going to put it out on Spotify. And maybe if I'm lucky, people are going to hear it. And if I'm really, really lucky, I'm going to make a nickel on it, anything. I'll talk about the economics in a minute. So I started tweeting about this. And I found Spotty Wi-Fi, <laughs> Fifi Wrong, Nifty Sacks, Mike Bass, Cristiano Covino, Alone Architect, the list goes on and on and on. These are all independent musicians who turned to Web3 in the last couple of years. Why? Does anyone know what's been going on in the music industry for the last 20 years? One word answer, theft. People have been stealing music, starting with the, streaming, uh, starting with the file sharing, and then moving to streaming services, where we have all been conditioned as, as listeners and consumers to expect that music for free, effectively. And the artists have been trained that they needed to work for free, you know, at least publishing their music, and they'd have to go out and Play shows and sell t-shirts. Well, guess what happened? COVID happened, and their livelihoods were basically destroyed. So backs against the wall, they turned to blockchain to see if they could actually sell their work online. Everyone remember what a record album was or a CD? There was a time when you would go to a store and you would buy music, and then you would buy it online, right? We're talking about doing that again and revaluing what's going on in music. And let me just talk about the economics around this for a second. So who in the audience knows how much you would make if you had a million listens on Spotify? If you know, don't say the answer. If you don't know, take a wild guess. $1, Not that bad, but $3,000 for a million streams. Yeah, and imagine what it takes to get the million streams, even to get viral, to market that. And you know, people play a lot of games to get on playlists. They do a lot. Uh, this woman in the very dead center of this picture, Violetta Zeroni, who's become a good friend of mine. I've been collecting her music and, and working with her on some projects. Um, She's got two NFT collections for her music, and between the primary sales of the NFT and then secondary sales on marketplaces of her NFTs, she's generated $2 million in revenue in about two years. Now, she, that's not all in her pocket. She has partners, and again, some of this is secondary sales, but she gets back in royalties on it, too. So that's, I think I did the math, that's 666 million streams on Spotify. Um, so that's a lot, right? Um, you'd never get to that. So good for Violetta. And you know, these people are in all genres, all ages, all styles of music. It's just amazing. Um, and these are just a smattering of the folks that I either know or support. There are hundreds, you know, if not thousands of people looking to Web3 for music now. So that is great. And I cared about that a lot because I had decided it was time for me to do something and a now, different. And now, Mr. Metaverse goes to Broadway. <laughs> No copyright was harmed in the making of that song on audio or that video uh, on Luma, of course, you know, other than the people whose uh, data was used to train that model. But that's a subject for another talk. Um, yeah, so long before I was into technology, I was a musician. I was at my father's side at the piano. 
uh, at the age of three. I've been playing instruments since I can remember. I sing, I write music. And that became, I went to music school first, and that became a sideline when I got into my tech career, but I kind of stayed fresh. I kept making music. And a while ago, I started on a project that got me to realize at some point, I'm going to quit the day job, I'm just going to go all in. And I decided to do that, and again, I discovered Web3 and music through that. And that is a project called Judgment Day. It is a musical about the end of the world. Uh, it's rock opera, boy meets girl, boy gets girl, boy loses girl because a malign entity known as the One first seduces and then enslaves all of humanity. And then the world is destroyed in a cosmic battle between good and evil and curtain. So I had, I had put this thing on the shelf for about 10 years. It was the early, it was the late early 2000s, right, right after the 9-11 attacks in the US. I was freaked out about the state of the world. So I wrote this whole thing over the course of six or seven years and didn't do anything with it for a decade. And then around 2022, after a couple years of demos and recording, I released the album. And this is the time where I was like getting serious about how are people going to hear this? How am I going to get people to listen to it on Spotify? Am I ever going to make music uh, money off the music? Am I ever going to be able to turn this into the live show that I envision? Because this is just the story and the score, right? And that's when I discovered my music NFT friends. And I decided to launch my own NFT collection, which I launched last summer. And it, it's still out there and in, uh, in progress and selling. And guess what? I used the money from the NFT sales to develop the live show. So I've generated about 30,000 US in revenue on this project already through NFT sales. And look at the beautiful artwork, by the way. That's my wife, Marina Berlin, amazing visual artist, mostly a sculptor. But she deigned to get back into Photoshop and do painting and do all this stuff and make me an amazing, basically, card deck, tarot card deck. So when you collect our music, you can also get a divination reading from us as a collector. So, you know, we're building a community around people who support the project. And like Marina says, it's sort of like Patreon meets Pokemon. So you've got all of those sort of supportive benefit tiers you can set up, but the, the people who support and collect also have a digital collectible, which could have some market value. It could also just be something that unlocks access to online shows at some point via smart contracts if we ever stream the show online. So I'm using the money to build the live show now. Finally, we're gonna bring this vision to life. We partnered up with Double Eye Studios. Some of you folks may know Double Eye. They've done incredible um, seminal work in XR. Uh, Kira Benzing is a theatrical director. She premiered a, uh, this is when I met her, she premiered a show uh, called Runnin', Reggie Watts' song, Runnin', it's a rap song. And um, she had people dancing on the ceiling in XR and instead of this gratuitous sort of use of the XR controllers that a lot of people do when they're doing demos because someone, you know, some tech company's funding it and says, I've got to use the controllers. She turned them into glow sticks. You're basically at a rave. And you're you dance up and around, defy physics. It was great. I loved her work so much. We became friends. We stayed in touch. And at last year's Augmented World Expo, first, I, first thing I um, did when I showed up, I, I, I do what I always do. It was up uh, north. I went to the Hyatt Lobby Bar uh, to just camp out and see who I would meet. And Kira showed up. And she's like, hey, you still working on that musical? So we started talking about this and decided we wanted to get into partnership together. So Double Eye is helping me take the book and the score and turn it into a live theater show, which I could not be more excited about, right? And again, this is funded by NFT development and something very concrete has already happened. Our first development workshop was a table read. We got together on Zoom with actors, we just read the script. That's all we did, we didn't even do any of the music. Well, we did one song just to kind of keep it moving along. But People read the script, we had other folks listening, watching, and giving us feedback, and I took some of that feedback, some of it you ignore, some of it you're like, yeah, you're really right. And amazing piece of the feedback was, okay, it's a love story between these two people. Well, spoiler alert, she dies at the end. Um, I need to feel it, I really need to feel it. So I don't believe those two are in love kind of thing. I'm like, oh my God, I have to do this. I have to write a love song, and I have to write a duet. So I went and did that, and I wrote a song called Leap of Faith, and that's a new song that's going to be out with the re-release of the musical online. And that was all the result of doing this development workshop. Would not have been possible without those NFTs. So it's so amazing. And I'm really, really excited about Web3 because of that. And here I was tweeting to the high heavens about everything I'm doing in Web3 and music. And I have a pretty sizable Twitter following, especially in uh, spatial computing. And <laughs> this happened. I mean, I'm really, I got to tell you, I'm a little bit shocked. This is my world. This is my 10th AWE in a row, I think. And I was really confounded by how few folks in our world in spatial computing 
we're getting on to understanding what's going on in blockchain and Web3. Um, I mean, here, my conversations tended to be like this. I'm like, okay, here we go. And then, and these are people I like really respect, like ex-colleagues at Unity or whatever. Like, well, NFTs, no, screw that. It's all grift, whatever. Um, and I'm like, come on, let's get, you know, I'll, I'll tell you all about it. And it's like, no, no, thanks. So that's unfortunate. And um, I'm still a slight bit frustrated by that, though. I do see things changing a little bit and folks becoming more and more aware. So that is why I decided I wanted to do this talk today because I really want to talk about this for folks who might be skeptical about blockchain, Web3, NFTs, uh, because from where I sit, I still think it is um, blockchain tech and all the associated uh, things I've been talking about are the keys to creative and financial freedom going forward. That's why it matters. It's about, again, I said it before, I'm going to say it again here. It is about creative, cultural, and financial self-sovereignty and self-determination. Okay, we love Meta. I love my quest, but if you want to make something for the quest that's not a game or maybe a fitness app, good luck. Good luck getting distributed. Good luck even getting it into the app store, possibly. There is someone who runs a platform who's making the rules about not just whether you can reach people, but what kind of experience you should be making. When you go back and look at the uh, slide of musicians I put up there, um, the other thing that was happening with Spotify and these streaming services is you have to make a certain kind of music or the algorithm won't pick it up. Quick sidebar tale, I was at South by Southwest two years ago and the general counsel at Spotify was interviewing a fellow who'd had a catalog of all South Asia, Asian music, so Indian, Pakistani music, and the global listenership of South Asian music is about 330 million worldwide on streaming services none of their music ever gets discovered on the Spotify algorithm. So you're literally changing your creative in order to just get discovered. So you can't, you know, as musicians go, you can't write the songs and deliver the songs that you want your audience to hear if you, have, if you want to get picked up on streaming services. There's another way to do this now with Web3. You also don't need millions of listens. You can have a few hundred, a few thousand true fans, and they're paying real money. They're paying hundreds to small thousands of dollars to support your career. It is a different world with Web3. And the same thing, I think, can apply in spatial computing and metaverse, which is why I, I'm using the music, musicians as an example. You don't need, if you don't want to make a game, <laughs> if, you, if you start making something in XR and then you pivot to be a game shop so you can get it on the meta app store, maybe you don't have to do that in this new world we're talking about with Web3. That is my hope, and that's why I think that more and more folks in spatial computing should really turn to this and take a look at it. But you know, that being said, oh, and by the way, I got I got a crow for a second here. You see this? This is a, a katana sword from the collection called Crash, Punk, Crash Punks, uh, made by Grace Ung. Some of you may know her. She ran through the ARs. I think you know her, Lex, right? Grace is awesome. That's where I met her uh, three or four years ago now. That's a GLTF model on the Bitcoin blockchain. And by the way, GLTF, even, even though maybe spatial computing folks who are building metaverse stuff haven't fully embraced Web3 yet, Web3 has definitely embraced metaverse tech in, when it comes to 3D because GLTF is the ubiquitous format for putting 3D models online for NFTs and what they call ordinals in Bitcoin. So that's kind of amazing. So it's, gonna, it's happening anyway. It's just really happening in this really uh, small, collectible way. People aren't building too many uh, uh, metaverse worlds on this yet. Again, I'm going to circle back to this because I was talking about this when it came to Lamina 1. Um, but before we get to that, that's the money shot. But before we get to that, let's, let's just talk about some of the bad and the ugly, just for a second, because that is, I, I, I would be remiss in not talking about what's not great in Web3. Uh, who has a crypto wallet here in the audience? Right, okay, about half of you, that's great. Well, I mean, it's true, right? I mean, the UX still completely blows. Any, any argument there? I mean, I, who designed this stuff? It's just ridiculous. And some people are trying to make strides at making that better, uh, better actually, you know, my alma mater. Lamina One is trying to do that. Um, crypto markets are super volatile, so depending on if you're dealing in certain currencies on certain blockchains, there's too much speculation going on, and that just creates a lot of in instability. Uh, who knows what a meme coin is? These are basically coins you can build on top of Ethereum tokens and other blockchains that then people just completely speculate on and have zero value otherwise, and they're just basically clogging up the network and making transaction fees more expensive, so screw that. Um, it's super elitist. But there's a plus and minus to the idea that you, know, you might have to spend hundreds of dollars to support an artist. Not everyone can do that. Um, 
Bitcoin ordinals are ridiculously expensive. They're, that's the, their version of collectibles. Um, and yes, everyone's still getting rugged left and right. There's still fraud, criminality everywhere you go. This is, these are true things. But the perfect can't be the enemy of the good here. I think we can move past that. And, oh, and then there's, of course, the environment. It's only the Bitcoin blockchain that really has this problem, which is it's grinding too many cycles, and it really is not great for the environment. But guess what? I was just reading this, and people aren't going to want to hear it, but on the current trajectory that um, Gen AI is on, the cloud compute that it's consuming is going to um, overtake blockchain in about three years. So you have to ask yourself, what is the compute being used for? And at the end of the day, those cycles were burning to the good. Maybe we're saving energy because we're not traveling somewhere. Maybe we're saving energy because we're not packaging a bunch of crap in the plastic packages and shipping them on you know, planes and you know, whatever. So you have to really look at the whole problem. So it's not to say that is not an issue with uh, proof, of work, uh, proof of work in Bitcoin, but uh, it's not the whole picture. So what's on the horizon here and some great stuff that's coming. Um, is you know in the in the sort of virtual world and blockchain meets spatial computing uh, thing is Nifty Island has has played Nifty Island yet? It's sort of people trying to do Second Life again. It's open world stuff, but it's got NFTs integrated right into it, so you can build and sell digital art right in there. It's cool, but like a lot of these places, you go to their world. You're not building your own world, um, and. The art style all kind of looks like that. So if you don't want to look like a video game for 14-year-olds, you may be in a pickle trying to use Nifty Island. But still, it's very, very promising. Uh, Lamina One, the company I worked at, finally launched their mainnet, and they are very creator-focused. Everything they're going to do on their features is about create, share, monetize. And then there's some new open-world metaverse platforms. I'm advising this company, Ozone, and they're doing great stuff with open tech uh, connected to blockchains. And then, by the way, if you've been hearing about Web3 Gaming, uh, Axie Infinity and some of those other um, things that came out a few years ago. That was the most ill-conceived thing in the world. I'm just going to opine right now. Play to earn, if you know what that means, makes like zero sense if the game sucks. And that was a game that was never good. So you're never going to get a bunch of people sitting there pushing buttons, making stuff in your world so that they can make money. That was just the silliest thing. But of course, venture capitalists loved it. It was absolute flypaper for them. But Folks are coming around, one of the, and one of the reasons you're going to see Web3 games launch with, with success now is a lot of those games, thank you to John Ratta from Beamable, he's got a great infrastructure that does this, uh, supports Web3 gaming. Those games have been in development for 18 months, they're like AAA. So that's why we haven't seen good stuff for a while, they've been in the can. They're going to be coming out in the next couple of years. So super promising, we're going to see all that. And, um, I'm also working in a digital marketing agency. I'm partnering with a couple of old friends. Um, we're called The Seven. Uh, I'll tell you what, that actually came from my Seven Rules of the Metaverse paper. Um, and we're writing a book called The Million Ways to Die in the Metaverse, um, a guide for marketers. And we are very focused on how do you take all these great new tools and the monetization of Web3 and spatial computing and help marketers and brands succeed to tell their stories. And so that also needs just open technology top to bottom. So, I'm really excited for the future of that. And just to reiterate it one more time, and then we might have one or two minutes for questions, Chris, maybe, if you want, yeah. Um, I'm going to say it again. There could be no open metaverse without Web3. So if you're one of my spatial computing homies, please take a serious look at this again. Um, I think this is the world that we need to build going forward for creative and financial freedom. Thank you for listening. We have time for one question. One. Sorry. <laughs> it's a packed house. It's an honor. Uh, Tony, thank you for this great uh, survey of really all of Web3, uh, the ecosystem, the economy. Uh, and this is really a technology that has stood on the shoulders of giants. And, and you are absolutely one of those giants. Uh, back in thank those you, days, Mark. right, with VR, uh, VRML, uh, the technology was not there. It didn't look as it should. It didn't work as it should. Now it does, right? Now, even though it's not pretty yet, but it's 100% works, uh, but still adoption, you know, still artists are struggling, still uh, causes are not being um, seen and heard uh, because people, you know, you go to GDC, you go to some other conference and oh, Web3, no, no, and it's not so special. Well, what is stopping now? Now that we have everything, now that we've already done the work, what is left? And uh, tell us about also, um, uh, Metatron, and, and how is that helping? So Metatron's the umbrella for my company that's creating this content, like the NFT collection around my musical. And thank you for that, Lex. I really appreciate it and the kind words. 
Um, I don't know what's stopping us. I do think there's some FUD over here in spatial computing land where people just need to get more educated on what's going on in Web3. I actually think a lot of it is just self-harm on the Web3 side, though, because it really is. Web3 is kind of like Deadwood, that TV show on HBO, if you've seen it. It is literally the Wild West. We're in Montana uh, in 1888 or something. It is just, there's too, no regulation, too much theft and all that. So those problems are still really real, and they're, they have a knock-on effect where they're creating perception problems. But that's why I'm asking folks here, you know, take a fresh look at it. This could be your path to self-determination. Thank you for that, Lex. I know we got to go. Thanks again, audience. See you at the show. Have a great AWE.